of it uh, today. And uh, with that, now another thing that is a real privilege, I am super excited to introduce our keynote speaker for the event uh, to bring to all of you the one and only Dr. Jeffrey Hinton. Dr. Hinton is a British Canadian cognitive psychologist and computer scientist who's most noted for his work on artificial neural networks. Since 2013, he's divided his time working for Google with Google Brain and the University of Toronto. And in 2017, he co-founded and became the chief scientific advisor of the Vector, Vector Institute in Toronto. And uh, Professor Hinton is a Turing Award winner and an AI pioneer, widely regarded as a godfather of deep learning. And I think it's safe to say that his work and research have been hugely influential in driving the development of artificial intelligence as we're coming to know it, and also our understanding of the human brain. So now please join me in welcoming, I am very, very excited to have the chance today to learn from Dr. Jeffrey Hinton. Dr. Hinton, hello. Hello. Um, I will now try and share my slides. Ah, it worked. Looking um, good. Okay. I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes, maybe slightly longer, about the history of neural nets. Um, you're very smart, so you'll, I'm going to go very fast because you're going to understand it. Um, so there was a war that went on for about 60 years. Um, between two different schools of thought for how you would make intelligent systems. One was the logic inspired approach, which was dominant until about 2010, um, 2012 actually, um, that thought that intelligence is all about applying symbolic rules to manipulate symbolic expressions. It's a very naive theory that thinks that what goes on outside your head, like sentences, um, must be the same stuff goes on inside your head, which is just crazy. Um, the biologically inspired approach thinks the key to intelligence is learning connections in a neural network. Um, and as we'll see, that works much better. So I'm going to give you an example of intuitive reasoning um, to show you how illogical you are, how logic's not going to explain things. You have two options. One is all dogs are female and all cats are male. And the other is all dogs are male and all cats are female. Now I know this doesn't accord with biology, but even though it doesn't accord with biology, in our culture, it's obvious to everybody that cats are female. Um, this may be because um, dogs are big and stupid in case chase cats, but um, whatever it is, um, cats are female. And the question is, why is that obvious to us? Because it's not logical at all. Um, and the answer is that inside your head, your representation for cats is a big vector of neural activities. And that big vector of neural activities is more similar to the vector for women than it is to the vector for men. And so without doing any sequential reasoning, it's just obvious to you that cats are female if you have to choose. Um, so the question is, where do these big vectors come from? And that's what neural nets is all about. So we used to make computers do what you want by writing a program. And when you write a program, you have to tell it exactly what to do. Um, and that's tedious. The new way to tell computers what to do is you first write a program, which is tedious, to tell a computer to pretend to be a neural network. But this program isn't some specific neural network for doing a specific thing. It's a rather general program that just tells it how to learn, essentially. And then you show the network lots of examples of inputs and outputs, and it learns to create internal representations like those big vectors for cats and women that will allow it to do the task. So here's an example of something that symbolic AI just couldn't deal with. You take an input image, which is really just millions of real numbers, RGB values of pixels, and you wanna convert that to a string of words, so a caption. And Neural nets are now pretty good at doing that. And symbolic AI never came close to doing that. They couldn't recognize the things in the, in the image and they couldn't model, they couldn't generate natural language very well. So I'm gonna tell you how this works and I'm gonna try and tell you very quickly. Um, we're gonna have things that are very simplistic models of neurons. Real neurons are much more complicated, but these are good enough. They have incoming 
lines coming from other neurons, which have real numbers on them, which are the activities of those other neurons. They have weights on those lines. So you take the activity, you multiply it by the weight. You take that sum, that's the weighted sum of the inputs. If it's below a threshold, the neuron doesn't output anything. If it's above a threshold, it just outputs that sum minus the threshold. So it's just linear. That's called a linear rectified neuron. And they work very nicely. And so you now connect those up into layers and you have input neurons that would be the pixels. You have output neurons that would be things like recognized objects, the names of objects. And you have multiple intermediate layers where it's gonna learn representations. And so it's those intermediate layers that are interesting because it has to learn what to use those neurons for. Now, there's a way of training nets like this that everybody understands, and it's obvious that it'll work, and it's also obvious that it'll take in, be incredibly slow. So what you do is you take the network, you start with some random weights, and then you look at one particular weight, that one shown in red. And what you do is you put lots of examples at the input, and you look to see the answers that come at the output, and you get some measure of how good it is, how many did it get right. And then you change the weight just a little bit, and then you look at lots of examples again and say, how many did it get right? And if it does better, you keep the change. And if it doesn't, you don't keep the change, or maybe you make the opposite change. Um, that's a kind of mutation or evolutionary learning algorithm. And it's incredibly slow because you have to change the weights one at a time. There's another algorithm that essentially achieves the same thing, but is faster by a factor of the number of weights because it can change all the weights at once in a sensible way. And so if you've got a trillion weights, which big neural networks now have, it's a trillion times faster than this algorithm. And the other algorithm says you put your inputs in, you go forwards through the network to get the answers, you look at the difference between the answers and what you got, and then you send information backwards through the networks in just the way that the brain doesn't in order to figure out how to change each connection strength so as to make the answers more like the correct answers. And that's just a little bit of calculus. It's just the chain rule of calculus. So it was really, in, it should be attributed to um, people hundreds of years ago. It's a very straightforward algorithm. Now, there's some things that are awkward about it. You have to have a lot of labeled training data to make this work. And the problem is almost all data is unlabeled. I can point a video camera at the world and get lots of unlabeled data. Um, but the problem is, where do the labels come from? You can pay people to label it, but that's a slow business. It's also slow in networks with lots of hidden layers, um, but we can make very fast chips. And indeed, Google and other people have, have made very fast chips. It can get stuck in poor local optima where any small change to weight will just make things worse. Now, it turns out everybody thought that would be a sort of fatal problem. It turns out in practice, that's not a problem at all. It does get stuck in local optima, but they're pretty good local optima. So that's only a problem for armchair theoreticians. Um, so in the 1960s, people designed very simple neural nets that didn't have these hidden layers and they learned things, um, but symbolic AI did better. In the 1980s, we came up with the backpropagation procedure, which is what I just described or outlined. Um, we, were, we thought this was gonna solve everything and there was lots of hype. And there were very few real applications where it worked better than anything else. And by the 1990s, people had, in computer science had pretty much given up on it because on small data sets, other machine learning methods work better. Um, but the point is, this is the only method that is like how the brain works. The brain has these connection strengths. It changes millions of them at the same time. And so obviously there's a form of intelligence which goes on in our brain, which works like this. And so there must be something like this that's right. And what we didn't realize back then was all you need is more data, faster computers, and a few little technical changes. So actually Canada um, was very significant in making these neural nets be accepted as a better way to do AI than symbolic AI. So in 2009, two of my students at the University of Toronto came up with a better speech recognizer. It was only slightly better, but they did it in the summer and the previous rec speech recognizers were developed over, th over 30 years. And now all the best speech recognizers use neural nets. In 2012, two more of my students 
came up with a better way of recognizing objects and images. And actually their way was much better than the existing technology, got half the error rate. And now all the best object classifiers use neural nets. So in about 2011, people who submitted papers about neural nets to computer vision conferences were told there's no place for neural nets in a computer vision conference. By 2013, most of the papers in computer vision conferences were about neural nets. And in 2014, neural nets did much better at machine translation due to work done at University of Montreal and Google. And that was the real nail in the coffin for symbolic AI, because machine translation says, take a string of symbols in one language and produce a string of symbols in the other language. And if symbolic AI can't even do that, as well as neural nets, then it's hopeless. Um, so computers got faster, data sets got bigger, and we discovered some technical tricks. I, of course, am very interested in the technical tricks, but that's not the main point. So the new dogma is that um, if you want to learn something, use backpropagation to get the gradient on a mini batch of examples, make small changes to the weights, and that'll improve the performance and use a huge computer and a huge amount of data. And that's the correct way to um, learn things now. And you've all seen things like GPT-3, which can generate amazing stories, having simply learned to predict the next word in a whole lot of text. And when I say a whole lot of text, I mean like of the order of a trillion words of text. Now, one question is, is this, has this got anything to do with how the brain works? because it was inspired by the brain. We knew there had to be a form of intelligence that worked by changing connection strengths, because that's what the brain does. Um, but the question is, can the brain do this? Now, what we've really shown in the engineering is that if you can get a gradient, if you can figure out how all the weights should change slightly to improve performance, then you can do amazing things. But that doesn't prove that the brain gets the gradient using backpropagation. And many people have tried to figure out how the brain might do backpropagation, but it basically doesn't work. We can't make a convincing story. You have to send information backwards and it has to be through the same weights. And it's hard to make that work as a theory of the brain. It's particularly bad for sequential data like video. In video, data is streaming in and you have to process this data as it streams in and you don't have time to stop and go backwards to get gradients you have to be working in real time. And you also don't have all the storage to store all the previous internal states, which backpropagation requires. So basically dealing with streaming, streaming video kills backprop because there's not enough storage for it. So what can we put in its place? Well, back in 1983, essentially before backprop, Terry Sinofsky and I came up with a learning algorithm called the Boltzmann machine learning algorithm. Um, and that uses two different phases. Instead of backpropagating, um, it uses two different phases that work just the same way, except that in one phase, you're showing it data, and the other phase is making up its own data. And that second phase um, is sleep. Um, now, it wasn't very efficient, not nearly as efficient as backpropagation. And the computer science community still views this algorithm as completely crazy, even though a version of it was used for a long time to recommend movies to you in Netflix. Um, my bet is this is how the brain gets gradients. And the main reason for believing that is because it can learn video without ever having to interrupt and go backwards. The learning algorithm is very simple. It says that when you're looking at real data, whenever two neurons fire together, increase the strength of the connection if the frequency with which they fire together is greater than the baseline. If it's less than the baseline, decrease the strength of the connection. So while you're awake, it's a very simple learning algorithm. When you're asleep, what you have to do is compute that baseline. And that's more complicated and I won't talk about it. Um, and now we come to questions. All right, thank you for queuing us up, Dr. Hinton. And I, I actually want to bring in a moderator who is particularly well suited, I think, to lead this conversation and the Q&A period. Uh, so it is my pleasure to make one more introduction to join Dr. Hinton here. 
on our digital stage. And I want to introduce Jennifer Smith, who is Director of Product at Google Cloud. She's an executive with deep expertise in bringing products and services to market. And I know her to be personally passionate about STEM fields and advocating for STEM career choices among young women. She was named one of the top 40 under 40 in the Waterloo region for her efforts to create social change through business and technology and for her work promoting engineering and tech careers among young women. I'm very happy to welcome you, Jennifer, and to cede the stage for you to lead this conversation and Q&A period with Dr. Hinton. So thank you for joining us and please take it away. Great, thanks, Jeff, appreciate it. Dr. Hinton, thanks for a quick glimpse here on neural networks. Um, I, the first thing that comes to mind though, just based on the story you've told here, is what was it like working on neural nets when very few people believed in them, right? That was a long history you described where people just were not believing. Yeah, quite a few psychologists believed in them because they had to be how the brain worked. But within computer science, within the engineering community, um, there were long periods when they thought it was complete rubbish. Like when I started my PhD, people would tell me, you seem quite bright, but you're working on these neural nets and everybody knows they're never gonna work. Um, and I had to deal with a lot of that in my career. And you just have to stick to it and develop close friends who believe in the same thing as you do. And we developed our own little kind of fringe community of people who believed in neural nets who were regarded as crazy. Um, and now this fringe community of crazies is at the heart of everything which is nice. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, uh, that's probably a good testament many years later. But if the psychologists believed in them and the scientific community didn't, do, do you understand why that was? Like, I, I would say most of the time we experience science in the tech fields advancing and, and learning and understanding, you know, faster than other fields. So why, why was that not the case with neural nets? Simply because they didn't work that well. If they'd worked in 1986, there'd have been a revolution then. Um, we didn't understand. Some of us thought that, well, if we have much bigger neural nets running on much bigger computers, which much bigger data sets, they work much better. But that sounds pathetic to say that, you know, it would work if it was really big. Um, it turned out that was the answer. Um, but we couldn't actually show that until we could make really big ones. Understood. So scale was the key. Scale was the key, yeah. So listen, Dr. Hinton, we're getting a lot of questions. I see a lot, I see some hands up on the Zoom. If I can just ask the audience to type the questions that you might have in the chat, it's a little bit easier for us visually to catch them through the chat. So you can't see all the participants, but um, I'm gonna pass the mic over to uh, Finn, if you, uh, cause I can see you. So Finn Vamusi, if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, first of all, I'd, it's such a huge honor to talk to you, Dr. Hinton, but I'll contain my fanboy for now. Um, do you think there's any way to design neural networks or machine learning algorithms in a way that you could contain like a, a super intelligence? And is there any point in doing so? Or should we just let it do its thing once it gets a certain amount of intelligence? It seems to me it's very unlikely that when we make artificial neural nets, they'll end up being exactly the same smartness as us, right? Um, and so it seems to me in the very long run, they're liable to end up being much smarter than us. But that's in the very long run. We're very flexible. We had a lot of evolution. We've got a big brain. Um, we're very good at using it for the kinds of things we need to do. Not very good at using it for the things it wasn't evolved for, like arithmetic. Um, I think in the end, philosophically, I think it's highly likely that machines will get much smarter than people. But I don't think that's anything we need to worry about for the next 10, 20, 50 years. Okay. Thanks for Thank the you. question, Finn. Uh, picking up on a question in the chat, uh, Dr. Hinton, we've got a question from Andrew. Thanks, Andrew, for posting on the chat. What do you think of the potential of the field of reinforcement learning? Okay, um, I go up and down on this. There's been, it's getting better and better. For many years, I said reinforcement learning was kind of hopeless. Because in reinforcement learning, you get one scalar quantity, which is, and you often get it with a big time delay, which is how well you did. And you're trying to learn billions of weights. We know networks to do good things have to have billions of weights. You're trying to learn these billions of weights based on this one scalar quantity. And there's just not enough information in it. Um, but people have made reinforcement learning work pretty well by training a net on huge numbers of examples for a huge length of time. Um, 
So they've shown that it can be, be made to work. And I think reinforcement learning is going to work pretty well when you apply it to models. So you have to have two kinds of learning. You have to learn to model the world and learn how the world works. And that's not done by reinforcement learning. That's done by what's called unsupervised learning. And once you've done that, you can apply reinforcement learning to your model. So people have shown that you can learn games by applying reinforcement learning to the pixels on the screen, but that's a crazy way to do business. You'd much rather apply reinforcement learning to things you've abstracted away from the pixels, like the ping pong ball that's moving across the screen. You'd like to have the position of the ping pong ball, the XY coordinates of the ping pong ball, and use that to decide how to move your paddle rather than just the pixel intensities. And that means you want to build a model of what's going on and then use that model in reinforcement learning. And I think, I think most people in reinforcement learning now believe that's the ultimate way to do reinforcement learning. So the heavy lifting is going to be done by unsupervised learning that figures out how the world works. I have a, I have a question I'd love to get your input on, Dr. Hinton. And there's a, a question similar in the chat, I think, from, from Sam as well. What's the future of deep learning? Like, do we, are there, are there problems you foresee that AI is not ready for yet? Are there areas still to improve? What, what do you think will be the next break in the field? And, and do you think the field's overhyped? Yeah, on the issue of whether the field's overhyped, um, it's clearly going to be either overhyped or underhyped, um, but I don't know which. So if you read estimates of the economic value of deep learning, the estimates I've seen range from like $100 billion to $19 trillion. Um, and I think the value is somewhere in between, probably. Um, it's very hard to know. It's very hard to see long term into the future. But it's certainly the case that people have already invested of the order of $100 billion in it, um, if you look at all the governments and big companies and so on. And I don't see anything in principle that we won't be able to do with neural nets. Um, we don't know how to do many things yet, particularly deliberate reasoning, which was what the logic-based AI thought was the core of intelligence. We see that as a kind of skin on top of intelligence, the sort of icing on the cake, and the thing that developed last. And we don't know how to do that very well yet, although we're getting better. I think that uh, that answers one of the questions we had here in the chat from Stefan, who was looking to understand some of the main problems that still remain to be solved in deep learning. Um, and so that 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 reasoning component that you just spoke of there, I think, is one of those one of the answers to that question. When it comes to um, the human brain's ability to learn uh, from small amounts of data, here's the question. Why is the human brain able to learn from small amounts of data? whereas neural networks require so much more data? And that's from Stefan and Albert who are listening in. That's a very good question. And it relates to the question of whether the human brain is actually using backpropagation. So backpropagation is very good at using a lot of data to squeeze a lot of knowledge into not many connections. So by not many connections, I mean only a few billion. Your brain has like 100 trillion connections. And so the models that can do translation between all common pairs of languages have enough connections in them to fit into one voxel in a brain scan, roughly speaking. In other words, they're tiny in, in neural terms, these models. So backprop is really optimized for getting a lot of information into a few connections. And our brain is not optimized for that. You have 100 trillion connections and you live for only about a billion seconds. So even if you sort of look at 10 things a second, as far as your visual system is concerned, um, you've got about 10 to the four or 10 to the five connections in your brain per second of your life. That's quite reasonable because the cost of maintaining a synapse, a connection between two neurons for your lifetime is much, much less than the cost of living for a second. So we're short on experience, but rich on hardware. And so whatever learning algorithm we use, we're using is optimized for statistical efficiency. That is making good use of not much experience. However, people often don't realize that you might think you didn't have much experience of something, but because of the way the brain works, you're using all the other things you ever learned about 
to get leverage. And so even if you have very little experience in a, a particular domain, all the other domains you know about are relevant to your ability to learn. So actually, it's not so clear that people are extremely efficient. What they're efficient at doing is making use of all the other things they know to help with some particular thing. Yeah, I think I experienced that fairly regularly, which is why I continue to try to remain open-minded so that I can take more inputs and continue to learn myself. Yeah. Dr. Hinton, we're almost, I think we have just time for one, one last question. It's a deep philosophical question, but if you can give us your 30 seconds on it, can neural nets be conscious? Um, we can be conscious and we're neural nets. So the question is already answered. People have a very weird idea of what consciousness is. They think of consciousness as like some special substance that imbues the brain with whatever. And I think it's all based on a misunderstanding of how language works. To describe what's going on in our brain, what we do is we either describe what would normally cause it. So when I say I'm seeing pink elephants, pink elephants doesn't refer to something in the brain. It refers to what would be out there in the world if the brain was doing normal perception. Or we were to refer to what it would normally cause. So when I say I feel like punching you, um, that is what I've got in my brain is what would normally cause that. Um, and then we have other words for I feel like punching you, like angry. Um, and there's one case in which we use both what would cause it and what it would cause, which is when the language of thought. So when I say, I, I can say Jack thought, and then anything you can put in quotes can be put after Jack thought. And it's not that that symbolic expression is in Jack's head. What you're saying there is whatever it is in Jack's head, whichever big vectors of activity are in Jack's head, are the vectors of activity that will be caused by him hearing that expression and would also cause him to say that expression. So with the language of thought, you're tying it down at both ends, but it doesn't mean that the sentence in the phrase Jack thought quotes, blah, 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 like Jack thought, damn, um, that's not a proposition, but um, so people, I think, are deeply confused about how our language for referring to things inside our head works. And that gives rise to these crazy ideas that consciousness is some kind of special fluid that's lacking in neural nets. Thank you, Dr. Hinton. I know, I know we're over. I know there were a few other questions that we weren't able to, uh, to get to today, but really appreciate your time. Um, and to the audience, thanks for, uh, thanks for having us. I know I was uh, super excited to hear from, from Dr. Hinton today. Uh, there's a, been a, a request for some papers recommended to read, Dr. Hinton. I'm sure we can follow back up separately with some of that information uh, that can be shared out for the audience today. So I think maybe I'm passing it back to Jeffrey, but I'm not totally sure. Not you, Dr. Hinton, the other Jeffrey. <laughs> I'm perfectly happy to be on the program today as the other Jeffrey. That was <laughs> awesome. Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, Professor Hinton, thank you so much. That was a fascinating conversation. I wish we could keep you all evening, but I know that we need to work towards wrapping up. So I'm going to go ahead and throw a reaction with some clapping up into uh, my little video window. But yeah, show me the claps. Give us the claps. Uh, thank you all again. That was that was really, really interesting and awesome uh, and quite thought provoking. And thank all of you for the fantastic questions. As we said, this is a great opportunity to engage, to leverage experience outside of your own to build your knowledge while we're building our network and building community. And with that now, friends, I am going to move into closing for the day. Have a few notes for you as we wrap. Um, first off, it should be clear from the conversations today with Dr. Hanton, with Jennifer Smith, with the industry leaders and alumni that we've had joining us, that we are living in a world that is changing very, very quickly. It is a world that is literally in the process of becoming something new. And if we're living in a world of accelerating and exponential change, then I would argue that each of us has the opportunity and maybe the imperative to become something new as well. And so the question of course is, what will you become? And the answer, as I have said, is that I hope that you will work to become today the leader that tomorrow needs you to be. So I want you to go forth, to do well, to be awesome, to learn and to lead wisely, and to know that you have a lot of people in your corner. And with that, a few final notes and announcements. 
Uh, for the Schulich Leader Squads that are getting together after the event today, we wish you a fantastic time and some good conversation and learning. Uh, I have a huge thanks to give to the Schulich Foundation for sponsoring this event, to our guest speakers and Schulich leaders for joining us.